Okay, so it's 1.30, I see. And my name is Amber Herman. I'm gonna be the moderator for this last section. And just the same as the moderators before, I'm gonna give a 10 minute warning to everyone who's talking in this session. And if you're ready, we can get going. So up first we have Sanjay Joshi and his advisor is Dr. Perry. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sanjay. Today I'm going to talk about my research results on the molecular function of a transcription factor LBD40 in embryogenesis. I'll be talking, how does this, this protein plays an important role in embryogenesis? What happens if there is a mutation in this protein? And what other interesting regulation does LBD40 do with, involved with embryogenesis? But before that, I want to introduce with the term somatic, somatic embryogenesis, which is a process where the somatic cells are redifferentiated into embryos. And this is an image here to visualize how the somatic embryos look like. It is an important mode of regeneration where it can address the current challenges of food production or the scientific questions to test the gene function. Apart from that, you'd be surprised to know that about 70% of our diet consists of seeds, which increases the significance of studying embryogenesis. We cannot imagine a day without seed. Moreover, somatic embryogenesis is more accessible and available tool to study compared to the zygotic embryos, which are embedded into deep maternal tissues. So now let's dive on to the literature what we have. A prominent and well-studied uh, transcription factor, AGL15, has been shown that it accumulates highest in the heart stage embryo. Here is the Im image of the heart stage embryo of Arabidopsis. The yellow color are the specs of the AGL15. So AGL15, it's a transcription factor. Transcription factors are the protein which bind to a DNA and they regulate the gene expression. It belongs to the MATS domain transcription factor. And apart from the C development, AGL15 is also involved in uh, other uh, developmental phases like flowering, and it expresses and represses some genes. So AGL15 has been studied and we know where it binds and what genes it regulates. Here is the simple model of gene regulatory networks where we are seeing the black arrows are showing the direct regulators and the blue is the protein-protein interaction. Lake one, lake two, ABI3, FUSCA3, these are the key regulators of embryo identity genes. These are also the transcription factors. Interestingly, you see that all the arrows in one way or another are directing to this protein of interest, which is my research topic, LBD40. We don't know what LBD40 does and where it regulates. So I want to introduce LBD40 now. LBD40 is the lateral organ boundary domain transcription factor, which is unique to plants. And here is the image of different developmental plants parts, where you can see the red color means it's highly expressed and the yellow color is low. It seems that it's highly expressed in the seeds, but when we zoom in and see it specifically, it's expressed in the embryo region. And LBD40 is directly expressed by the key identity, embryo identity genes. Also, LAB40 and AGL15 has shown ES2 hybrid interaction, which brings to our hypothesis that LBD40 has a very important role in gene regulatory networks impacting somatic embryogenesis. And my broader objective is to understand the overall mechanism of embryogenesis in Arabidopsis. Specifically, I am interested to know the interaction of AGL15 and LAB40 and to identify the direct and indirect targets of LAB40. To accomplish that, I'm using the model plant Arabidopsis in that which I'm working with the seeds and the embryo culture tissues. Now, the turn of results. The first slide I want to show is indeed, there is protein-protein interaction of AGL15 and LAB40. To do this, we demonstrate using co-immunoprecipitation. So LBD40 has a MIG tag and AGL15 has anti-AGL tag. So we grind the embryo culture tissue and we co-immunoprecipitate using AGL15 and we run the gel. And when we do the Western blot, we first detect the protein by using antibody for LBD40, which is make antibody. And with the same blot, we use another antibody of AGL15. So when there is AGL15, there is LAB40. And when there is no AGL15, there is no LAB40, suggesting that AGL15 and LAB40 have protein-protein interaction. Furthermore, for the second objective, we want to know where does LAB40 binds in the genome. To do that, we need to know, we use a technique called chromatin immunoprecipitation, which is also known as CHIP. So in this, this is a brief overview of the uh, protocol of CHIP. In this, we have the epitope tag LAB40, which has a MIG tag. First step is to use formaldehyde to glue the protein-protein or protein-DNA complexes. 
Next, we use the sonication to shear our DNA. We want 600 to 1000 BP of DNA. And we immunoprecipitate specifically using the antibody, which is MIC. And with the help of sephiros beads, we immunoprecipitate the um, chip DNA. And that is, next step is to reverse crosslink to remove and degrade all the protein. Just keep the chip DNA. So this DNA we can use for PCR or we send it for sequencing. So we send it for sequencing and we found that total of 703 different targets where the LBD40 binds. Among that 424 were seen in three replication and additional 279 were found at least two out of three replication. So the next step was to categorize this bound, this genes. So we want to know what is the group. So for that, we did gene ontology study and that we find that the important uh, biological functions like auxin mediating signaling pathway or the um, meristem maintenance or fatty acid biosynthesis process, these are also important and have been shown in literature which are involved in embryogenesis. The next step is to verify and validate those genes. So out of 700 um, genes, we chose six as our candidate targets based on the literature and they might have some prominent function or potential function in the seed or embryogenesis. So these are the six genes that we chose and we did the chip qPCR and we, this, the control is, uh, this is normalized using the non-bound control. And the six targets shows indeed they have enriched, um, enriched uh, fold enrichment. And we also want to know if lab 40 binds specific to the constant sequence in the whole genome. To do that, we run the chip MEME analysis in which we found there is CG rich over representation. And the next question we ask is, does lab 40 has a role in somatic embryos? And to do that, we have well established a system called SAMSE, which is shoot apical meristem somatic embryos. In this, we allow the mature seeds to complete germination in liquid media with synthetic auxin 2,4-D. And after 21 days, we see the seedlings which have popped out the embryo-like structures. And we count and make the percentage and the different lines that I used, the Columbia is the control line where we find 25% of Columbia showed shoot apical meristem. And overexpression of AGL15 shows more than 50%, whereas overexpression of lab 40 is 40%. And interestingly, when we mutate, when the lab 40 is not present, there is significant reduction of um, somatic embryos included with the close relative, which is lab 41. Furthermore, we want to know what is the gene expression of those lab 4041 in SAMSE? So we did the RNA sequencing and we found more than 2000 genes were increased transcript accumulation and over 1000 genes showed the decreased accumulation compared to control Columbia. And again, we want to categorize and find the functional categorization of those genes. And here the arrows, which I'm pointing out is showing related to embryogenesis, which has embryonic meristem, fatty acid biosynthesis, abscessic acid, response to lipid, oxidative stress and water depression. These are important functions which are known to have prominent role in embryogenesis. Now we want to compare to find the direct targets of from the CHIP-seq and the transcriptome data. So the next step will be to combine the both data and see if we have any overlapping genes to identify the direct and indirectly expressed or repressed gene. So we use the Venn diagram, we compare the lab 40 chip seq data and lab 4041 RNA-seq data, and we found 93 targets. Out of, with those 93 targets, again, we did the gene ontology study to find the functional categorization. And interestingly, we found there were water deprivation, fatty acid biosynthesis, meristem maintenance. These all are related to the embryogenesis. And we want to focus on these three targets, which potentially might have role in the embryogenesis. So I would like to hi briefly highlight what are these genes and what we know about them. So first one is the set domain containing a protein, which is SCT. This is involved in methyl transferase, targeting specific lysine residues for histone or H3. This is the image of the mutant line of SCT that I have, and it shows curly leaves and very thin and flowers early compared to the control. And in literature, we find that a well-known, well-studied set domain proteins like curly leaf, swinger, or MEA are there. They have been shown, they have directly or indirectly involved in embryogenesis. And LEC1, LEC2, FUSCA3, and ABAI3, which I said, which are the key identity embryogenes, which have shown regulation in the mutant line of the set domain. However, the protein that I'm studying, the set that has not been uh, well documented yet, and it is predicted 
to be involved in non-histone methylation, which makes another interesting- You're at 10 minutes. Is it involved or not? The second protein that I'm focusing is layer five or, or senesin associated. This is involved in the growth or stress tolerance and antisense line, the, the line have shown early flowering and senescence, which also makes another target to study. And third one is Lunik, which is a transcriptional co-repressor and it regulates the floral, ident floral identity, embryo or seed mucilage. And LUG also negatively regulates agamas. So these three genes I am following, other than that, there are other genes which have important role in embryogenesis. So the currently the working model, what we can see is there are different transcription factors which are directly uh, regulating LBD40. So LBD40 itself has its unique targets like SET, LEA5, LUG, or also it's having another co-regulator targets along with AGL15. With this, the future work, what I want to follow is like to see the, the mutant lines, the possible candidate target genes that I have, what, I, what is their role in somatic embryogenesis and to validate my qPCR by using qPCR, the RNA seq data, and do some genetic process to see the overexpression of LAF40 with the mutant lines and perform the EMSA experiment to validate the GC rich region, which I showed before using the EMSA experiment. With this, I would like to thank my supervisor, Dr. Perry, my committee members, lab member, my friends and other who have helped me to success in the research and find and motivate me and department, our department. Thank you so much. If you have any question, I'm to answer. Okay, so we have just a few minutes for questions. If anyone has questions, they can put them in the chat box or unmute themselves and just ask. So you have a question. During embryogenesis, expression of genes fluctuates over time. Have you characterized gene expression at different time points? No, that is a good question. And different stages have different gene expression. So we are focusing on the somatic embryos for 10 days because we don't want to get biased. After 10 days, we start seeing some kind of embryos already in the seedlings. So we start the 10 days. And for, I, I did not talk about my seeds, which I have mentioned on my abstract actually, because the seeds are also, we are just choosing a specific time point to compare with AGL15 when it is high, highly expressed. Similarly, with lab 40 and 41 mutant. Yeah, which is a good question. With different time points have different expression, but for my research point, I have not focused on different points. Okay, so you have another two questions, but yes, the first one is, is there any interaction between the LB40 and the media? So we haven't checked that yet. We are, I am doing is to hybrid now currently. That would be an interesting thing to see if there is lab 40 and, and media has an interaction. Okay, and then you have another question. What happens if you have OAGL15 and OLBD40? So when we overexpress lab 40 or overexpress AGL15 and do together, we can make the somatic embryos in the plate without any hormone addition. And separately, when we see the, uh, when we separately see the SAMSC results, overexpression of lab, lab 40 and overexpression of AGL15 gives high uh, SAMSC data. Okay, so we have time if anybody has another quick question or two before we move on. Thank you so much. Yeah, I can answer in chat. Yeah, otherwise, well, we have two minutes here. <laughs> otherwise, yeah, you can stop on, you can stop okay. sharing your screen. We can get ready for the next one in like about a minute. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Since he's got his slides pulled up, our next speaker is Mohammed Feda Ali, and his advisor is Dr. Kawashima. And you can get started. Um, thank you, Amber, for short introduction. Um, welcome, everyone. Today, during my presentation, I am going to present uh, the objective of my research work and some preliminary results from my ongoing PhD project. 
actually my phd project involved uh, in several projects uh, which includes uh, number one that where i'm check uh, i checked the uh, factors controlling the sperm nuclear migration and actually uh, the result we published from this work last year and besides that i'm also working some other projects where i'm interesting to check the endosperm development specifically in swabin and arabidopsis and today during my talk i will mostly talk about my i will only talk about my third project where i am checking the liquid endosperm development and how this control the seed size in arabidopsis seed seed development is vital for plant reproduction as well as for food here you can see the arabidopsis seeds this is embryo and endosperm and these two components are uh, very important for seed development and what we know that this endosperm actually serves as a nourishing tissue for embryo development and not only that for food production endosperm has a lot of importance here i put one example for rice but besides rice wheat corn in those crops the majority part of the part that we used for food is actually the endosperm here i am showing this entire part is starchy endosperm what we consume in arabidopsis endosperm follow different developmental stages it is start with, after fertilization it is start with liquid endosperm when the endosperm enlarges rapidly and the endosperm is only one single cell and the endosperm nuclei divides uh, without any cytokinesis and after rounds of nuclear division this endosperm is start to cellularize from the uh, uh, from the micropylar end and it completely cellularized and embryo reached at the heart stage condition so these two condition if i compare i can easily compare with the coconut if you think about coconut water so the coconut water is the liquid phase endosperm and the white part the solidified part is the cellularized endosperm and from previously published research work we know that uh, the timing of endosperm cellularization is important for uh, seed size determination after fertilization the liquid phase and after certain time it turns to the cellularization that produced the normal seeds but there are some mutants where we found that if the liquid phase becomes shortened then it produces the smaller seeds on the other hand if the liquid phase become longer then we are getting larger seeds so from that we know there is a strong association between this lag, uh, liquid phase and the cellularization phase however we don't know the details clue yet and from cellular dynamic point of view we also know that cytoskeleton is one of the major component for cell structure that uh, control the cellular dynamics and here one of uh, i am studying one of the major cytoskeleton f actin during the liquid endosperm development so to study the liquid endosperm we first uh, uh, observed the uh, f actin and we actually express the f actin in liquid endosperm and here you can see the green cable these are f actin and this magenta color nuclei are endosperm nuclei and in this image you can see actually this f actin is generating somehow a nice ester shape structure and if we see closely in this zoom image here you can probably see more clearly that this in, uh, ester shape st structure somehow controlling or holding the movement of endosperm nuclei so from that we know uh, not only from this uh, um, uh, snapshot image i also generate the live cell video and in this video you can also clearly see the phenotype of f actin and here you can see the nice star shape structure of f actin that generating during the um, liquid endosperm development and during the nuclear division it also somehow controlling the movement of the nuclei and at the end of the liquid phase when cellularization starts this f actin somehow disappear and which actually suggesting that this f actin is specifically doing something during this lag phase seed development however we don't know the details function 
of this F actin during this liquid phase. Therefore, in my project, I'm uh, interesting more. Uh, I'm now more interested to understand the other details function of this F, uh, F actin during this liquid phase endosperm development. So to understand the details function, I check the F actin in wild type condition that I showed previously. And we also generated other transgenic lines where actually we increase the expression of F actin that I'm saying as a constitutively active actin where we increase the expression. On the other hand, uh, I also generated another transgenic line where we actually kill the function of F actin. And here in this image, you can see in the when we increase the expression of F actin, somehow it's giving more bundle structure or more cables in this condition. And in the dominant negative form, when the function is got uh, re, uh, killed, the cable also uh, the cable actually become disrupted or this cable completely broken. So from that we know that they are specifically doing something during this uh, liquid phase of endosperm development. So further I wanted to study more details of their function during this liquid phase endosperm development. So to check their uh, details function, I actually observe the liquid endosperm development from after fertilization. So I checked uh, different stages of seeds uh, from one to five day after pollination. And here I'm showing the seed image or DIC image from five day after pollination condition. Here you can see this is wild type condition, then overexpression and dominant negative condition. So from those images, actually I wanted to study the size of this endosperm as they are ex highly expressed or may, uh, the function is got reduced in dominant negative. So I became interested to know whether this actin is somehow controlling the size of the endosperm. And to determine the size uh, with the help of uh, uh, images software, we actually drew the entire area of endosperm and then we uh, calculate the area from, from those images. And here I'm sharing the result from this experiment. And as I mentioned before, I observed the size of endosperm from one to five DAP, but I'm sharing the result from five day after pollination condition. This is uh, from wild type and then overexpression line and then the dominant negative line. And it's showing the endosperm size in micrometer. And from this result, interestingly, we found that the area of uh, the endosperm is actually significantly increased when we are increasing the function of F actin. On the other hand, when the function of actin is going down in that condition, the, uh, in the size of the endosperm actually reduced significantly. So not only that, um, I was also interested to um, check the seed size after that. And Actually, I also checked the final seed size or dry seeds in this, in this line. And here is the result from the seed size. And interestingly, similar to endosperm development or endosperm size, we also found the same result. So in the overexpression line, the seed size got increased significantly. And in the dominant negative line, the seed size was decreased. So, from uh, those experiments, now we found that yes, F actin is actually doing something in F, uh, in liquid phase endosperm. And we, we found that this F actin is required for the proper arrangement or movement of the endosperm nuclei. And we also found that this F actin is control the size of the liquid endosperm and that determining the final seed size. So not only that, uh, I'm also interested to observe the quantitative difference of effectin in this liquid endosperm. Therefore, my ongoing work is still going on to quantitatively, uh, quantitatively, thank you, quantitatively determine the effectin because we found that uh, there is a variation of effectin in overexpression and 
uh, dominant negative forms. So I'm trying to develop the method to get this result quantitatively. And previously, as I mentioned, there is a strong association between the liquid phase of endosperm and the cellularization. So in those line, I'm also interested to observe the timing of the liquid phase and cellularization phase changes. So I'm in process to get the data and hopefully I will get the data very soon to come up whether is this the case or is there any other function involved in this liquid phase over the on, uh, on the control of F actin. And above all, uh, I would like to thank to my supervisor and all my lab members for their support during my work and my department for the funding for my graduate studies and the Techroni Fellowship Award. And finally, I would also like to thank my committee members for their advice during and support for my PhD project. And above that, I want to finish my presentation and I'm happy to take questions from you. Thank you. Okay, so if anybody again has the questions, they can put them in the chat box or you can unmute yourself and ask them. Okay, so I have a question if no one will ask one. So you showed that the, the different um, ratios between cellularization and the liquid endosperm, and they have based on that ratio, there could be a normal size seed, a larger seed, or a smaller seed. Is there anything else that ratio uh, affects in the seed? Um, you mean the ratio of the seed? Uh, no, uh, not ratio, but like, uh, you showed that part of it can be so the, I don't know, the word I'm looking for. Uh, yeah. Yes, that. Does it affect anything else besides the size of the seed? Um, yes, there are some other things like um, based on the mutant analysis, it affect the uh, cellular, the time phase changes and the seed sizes. But beside the seed size changes, no. I mean, uh, there are some, uh, other gene regulation, some genes are upregulated or downregulated, but the end result is somehow this uh, smaller and larger seeds. And in larger seeds, actually, they from the, res the different experiments, they showed the larger seeds are actually abort. They cannot produce the viable seeds at the end. The size of the seeds become larger, but they somehow aborted. Okay. So we have a question now. How are you able to see inside the seed using the confocal microscope? Is the seed fairly transparent? Uh, no, not, 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 seed are not fairly transparent. So these are actually fluorescence protein. So uh, for the life act, I'm using the yellow fluorescence protein and the new, for the nuclei, I, I have RFP, RFP or red fluorescence protein. So with the help of those, uh, as this protein already expressed in the seeds, and then, yeah, I'm collecting the seeds into media, and then I'm checking into the confocal microscope. So it, uh, I mean, it's, it's, not the transparent thing, it's mostly the expression of the, those protein that already inside the seed. And in fluorescence, in confocal, we can just use the laser to observe the fluorescence. Can you have another question? This will probably be our last one. Would you expect quality changes by changing the seed side in a, in a crop such as soybean? So for the quality, we don't know yet. That is interesting question to address. So for soybean or any other seeds, yeah, we don't know whether this is actually changing in any quality or not. Yeah, that maybe in future we can check whether there is any changes of quality or not. But for now, we don't know. Okay, well, thank you. And we'll probably yeah. move on so you can, you can go ahead and stop sharing. Yeah. And we'll ask that the next presenter does share their screen.
And our next speaker, it looks like, is Lakshay Anun, and his advisor is Dr. Rodriguez Lopez. Okay, so go ahead whenever you're ready then. Uh, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, so uh, thank you for uh, coming for the talk. Uh, my name is Lakshya Anand. Uh, I'm a PhD student and a bioinformatician at uh, the amazing Dr. Carlos's lab. Uh, today I'm going to be discussing about, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, today I will be discussing about a bioinformatics tool that I uh, have developed as a part of my PhD thesis. Uh, as you can see, it's a tool uh, that uh, we can use to visualize the multi-omic data. Now, uh, currently, you know uh, that uh, every uh, field of uh, every omic field generate a lot of high throughput data. So, visualizing it is uh, is a way uh, to uh, uh, analyze. Uh, so, let's see uh, what uh, Chrome Map is. So, it's basically uh, an R package. Uh, R package is uh, something like an R software or tool that you can use in R, uh, which will uh, which can be used to map or annotate genomic features uh, like uh, uh, genes or SNPs, and to uh, also visualize the uh, uh, data associated with those features like gene expression or you name it, any multiomic data. So it's a, it's a compact genome representation where you can create like ideograms. Uh, it's uh, interactive, uh, uh, like you can hover over it and uh, you'll, you'll see uh, more information about it. Um, it's written in R, the most of the pre-processing part is written in R, but most of the, the actual graphics thing is uh, in the JavaScript. Uh, it takes uh, dead files as input, as most of you know that it's a very common bioinformatics format. Uh, for, you know, like that uh, allows you to specify the coordinate information of the chromosome and the annotation. It can annotate thousands of features. People have uh, even like done a million, like there are data sets like methylation point something where there are millions of data points. It can handle that as well. So how can you access Chroma Map? So uh, since it's an R package, you can use it as a command line. Uh, tool in like R Studio or something, but uh, there is a user friendly version, uh, which is like a containerized web application, which I'll show you later. Uh, you can use that as well. So let's um, uh, look at a simple plot you can construct using uh, Chroma Map. So you can say you have a bunch of features there, you annotated these features. And uh, then, of course, because the genome sizes are so large. Uh, each of these locus is defined as a genomic range and there could be multiple uh, features annotated within that locus. So the interactivity I was talking about is when you hover over these uh, locuses, it will show you this window, which is called a tooltip, which will tell you things like uh, the base pair, the, uh, the, the range um, of uh, that uh, specific locus, the number of annotation, and also these, uh, these names are uh, in, can be linked to the hyperlinks. So for example, if it's a gene, you can link it to uh, the NCBI gene database, so it, as an example. So uh, how can we visualize uh, data? So uh, let's talk about the numeric data first. So we have, uh, if you have numeric data in multiomics, there are several instances of numeric data like uh, gene expression value, differential expression, fold chain, you name it. So you have any numeric data you can visualize as heat map. Um, in this case, you can see the tooltip also shows the detailed heat map for individual annotated uh, features. Um, and some bunch of more information. So there's a concept of aggregate function. So the aggregate function is basically uh, for a given locus, if we have multiple uh, annotations, so each having its own data point. So an aggregate function can be used to generate a, uh, the representative data at that locus. So what we see here, if there are multiple annotation is the representative data. There's an option of using the average of data, sum of data, min or max of data, depending upon whatever the requirement is. But there's also an option of using count. Count is like, instead of the data, you want the number of uh, uh, annotations there. So it, you know, it will be useful like um, in this case. So uh, uh, other than heat map, you can also obviously uh, visualize it as a scatter or a bar plot. So a scatter plot will be used for you know, the distribution of the each individual uh, annotated features uh, per locus and the bar plot will represent 
the aggregate function. So if you use aggregate function for count, you can even visualize the density uh, as well. So you can even customize the y-axis range. So it's just an additional feature. Um, uh, other than that, you can also do conditional filtering of your data based on certain mathematical condition. Like in this case, uh, these uh, scatter plot, uh, anything which is negative is uh, is red. So you can choose any color. So conditional and these mathematical, uh, there are like a uh, bunch of options for mathematical condition you can use. Greater than equal to equal to any possibility you can use to filter your data and to have conditionally show. By the way, these scatter plots are also interactive and you hover over it in a plot when I show you, uh, you can see the data point as well as the the name so in analysis it uh, might be helpful the same you can do with the bar plot also for any conditional uh, filtering and you can uh, also add reference lines to it just uh, for the reference uh, so how about the categorical data so uh, you know just like numerical you can also uh, visualize categorical data there are several instances where you have categorical data it could be per feature or it could be a group, like you wanted to annotate genes and SNPs together something. So for each category, you can have a, a, a color associated with it and uh, the legend will, uh, will show you the, the category and the color and there could be any number of categories. And this is an example of adding labelings as well. Like you can add the labelings if you want to, sometimes it's uh, important uh, to use the labelings. Uh, labelings can be applied in any uh, plot, it's not only in the categorical data feature. Uh, then we have the conditional tagging, uh, the epi tags. You can tag uh, the locus uh, based on any condition. Uh, this could be uh, great if you have a, a mark based data like the epigenetics data, like methylation data. So, yeah. Uh, I'll just discuss quickly some of the other prominent feature, like the polytroidy. So, polytroidy is like uh, you can uh, pass uh, different sets of chromosome and each set of chromosome uh, can have different sizes. So, uh, and number. So let me show you an example. So here I'm uh, visualizing like a wheat genome and all the homeologous uh, chromosomes of it. As you can see, there are different sizes, there are different sizes. And uh, the, uh, so each represent a single ploidy. So each individual ploidy will have, uh, can have its own data. So it's independent of each other and it could be different numbers also. In this case, I'm, uh, I'm representing the the homologs or the homologs, but you can also use different species. So in a like comparative genomics, you can compare different species also. Uh, segment annotation is uh, sometimes you want to, you know, like uh, annotate the segment, like uh, the gene structure visualization. So you can do that as well. Like here, uh, you can compare the slice variants of genes. Uh, and then uh, you can also add like vertical lines. When you're analyzing, you are fixing this, you find a certain genomic region, you can mark them as well. Uh, there, it's highly customizable. There's like so many options, which I'll show you. Uh, and uh, you can export the plot either as a static image or as an HTML document. Uh, you can also include them in Shiny Web Application or R Markdown document. So uh, this is the Chrome Map app uh, UIs. Um, I'll, I'll show you if I have time at the end. Uh, so it's basically a containerized web application. It's available through Docker as a Docker image. So basically what it means is that uh, you can run it in any platform and it runs on your web browser and you know it, there's no dependency, you just a just few steps to, uh, to install it and then uh, it will uh, run on your computer. So it has an interface with you know, some panes. And so it basically a very uh, user-friendly version to use Chroma Map. And there are some features of like Zoom and Semi-Reactor, I'll, I'll show. So uh, what could be uh, some of the applications of it? And this, I've listed some of them. Uh, basically, there could be even more. There's any data you can visualize with it. You can annotate SNPs, uh, copy number variants, coding and non-coding genes on it. You can visualize the structure of the gene. You can compare the types variants of the gene. And it will be very good in comparative genomics, like you know, visualizing the synteny. Uh, and uh, like we've seen the homologous chromosome phased uh, genomes also like you can visualize and of course the data like gene expression profile, methylation profile, you can compare side by side. So these, these are the things you can do. Uh, we have uh, uh, for this tool, we have uh, a preprint um, publication which we put um, last year in 2020. We wanted to see, uh, I mean, whether people like 
how they reacted. So people have used Chrome Map in the past. They they have contacted us, and uh, there are uh, some cited example in which they've used it. Uh, this was basically only the version where the heat map and the discrete color map was available. All the features I've discussed now is just recently I've pushed it up. So it's a 2021. So hopefully people will use and cite it. Uh, and uh, you're at 10 uh, minutes. Uh, then uh, you can uh, so you can also include it in uh, uh, basically a web pages like I'll show you an example here. So uh, this is a collaborative project that we did with Dr. Uh, Dini Pua from from the Gluck Equine Center, and this is how in a web page uh, you can include them. So yeah, and uh, yeah. So uh, basically, I'll, I'll show you quickly that how the interface works. So this is basically uh, the app. So you can see, uh, so there are like things, there are like properties. So you go through, so uh, like for example, you can select the different files, you can select the different uh, ploides, and then you can just select the data you have, you say visualize data and it will visualize for you. And uh, suppose if you want to, to uh, like show the, uh, the scatter plot and I want, to change the height to like 40 say. So I'll just do, and so this is how. So if you see the scatter pod, you can even see the names of, uh, of the annotation feature, which will be good in uh, case of analysis. Uh, there's like so many other features I cannot like discuss not right now. Uh, it is available, um, it is available as a Docker image. So we also have a official uh, page website for public outreach. So you can like go and check it out. So it tells you how you can install like there are like few steps uh, in which you can install it. So there's a, like a documentation as well. So for our features and everything. So you can just go and, and see. So for, for uh, knowing more about the Chrome app. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. You have a question already in the chat box. Someone at, it was asked, can we observe or highlight the gene duplication events using this tool? Uh, yes, the gene duplication events, yes, you can. So basically you have to like construct the data uh, for it and then you can visualize it. Now. Okay, thank you. If anybody else has any questions, they can put them in the chat box or ask. Oh, I'm so, uh, so sorry. I forgot to sh to share. So I'm sorry. I forgot to. So this is uh, the interface for the Chrome Map app. Uh, and this is the website, uh, the official website for Chrome Map if you want to know more about it. I'm sorry, I forgot to share it. Um, so we do have just a couple minutes yet if anybody else wants to ask another question before we move on. Uh, yeah, so uh, this is the uh, collaborative project with Dr. Buha from, from the Gluck Institute. So this is how we can include it in web pages, the interactive version. Of. Okay, so you had one more question come in. It says, what would you say are the major benefits of your program versus others that are out there? Uh, first, uh, like uh, you can annotate thousands of features and uh, it's uh, basically uh, like, uh, it's not like it could be for any living organism as long as uh, you have the coordinates or anything and it's uh, interactive uh, and uh, so now there's like a web access to it also so yeah so basically uh, any like uh, uh, data that you have any biological data or uh, it's uh, you can use with the tool 
Okay, and one last question before we move on. What technical problems did you have to overcome to develop this package? Oh, so yeah, so well, basically I said, I started developing this with the JavaScript and there's a whole lot of like coding. So it's not like it, it's, uh, it's been, uh, it took me like a year, not like a year basically. There were challenges in the, you know, like to figure out the algorithm. So it's kind of a, a graphics package, like GD plot or something. So, but, you know, I cannot like discuss now, but there have been programming challenges, but I'm a, like a computer engineer. So I am proficient in programming. So yeah, so I just overcame those problems there. Well, thank you very much. We're gonna go on to our next speaker then. Thank you. Okay, so our next speaker is Joshua James Singleton, and his advisor is Dr. Yuan. And whenever they, whenever the screen, share their screen. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, uh, and then, so how do I share the screen? Um, the green button at the bottom. Oh, okay. Yep. Okay, then whenever you're ready, you can get started. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Today I will be presenting to you my presentation over the transcription factor BHLH92 and its effects on monoterpenoid indole alkaloid biosynthesis, possibly via a protein protein interaction in Catharanthus roseus. When a plant is attacked by a feeding insect, the regurgitant produced by the feeding insect elicits a defense response in the plant. Uh, local wounding, such as like this wound right here, um, by the herbivore leads to a burst in newly synthesized jasminate. This newly synthesized jasminate triggers a biosynthesis of specialized metabolites for defense throughout the plant. One such example of um, this metabolite is uh, monoterpene and dull alkaloids. Monoterpene and dull alkaloids are vinca alkaloids derived from the indole and iridoid biosynthesis pathway of the jasminate response signaling pathway. It is used for defense in Catharanthus roseus. Two uh, MIAs of importance are vincristine and vinblastine. They're derived from the condensation of tryptamine and cyclogamine, which are products of the indole and iridoid pathways. Vincristine and vinblastine are vitally important components in the treatment of certain cancers. Vincristine and vinblastine are atinioplastic agents. This means they destroy, inhibit, or prevent growth and or spread of tumors. For example, leukemia is characterized by an elevation in white blood cell count. When patients are treated with vincristine and vinblastine, it lowers said white blood, count, uh, white blood cell count in said patients. But there's a problem with using vincristine and vinblastine. It's expensive and in limited supply. This is due to the fact that the plant produces these MIAs in low yield. So it takes about 500 kilograms of leaf biomass, of catharanthus leaf biomass, to produce just one gram of product. And it's also impractical to produce these or chemically synthesize these in a lab setting in a large scale uh, program due to the structural complexity of these compounds. Thus, uh, metabolic engineering strategies have been employed. But they've come across a problem. Um, you can't just upregulate a single transcription factor or their downstream targets. It doesn't lead to an increase in MIA accumulation, net uh, MIA uh, accumulation. But instead, there's a large uh, regulatory feedback loop that's controlled by a plethora of J responsive transcription factors that either activate or repress um, known points throughout the uh, biosynthesis pathway. There are many different family groups of uh, transcription factors involved in this and with members that activate and some repressing. What this should symbolize to the viewer right now is just how complex the, uh, the sets of knobs and levers and uh, switches that need to be uh, 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 that need to be uh, aff affected to actually cause a, a downstream increase in MIA accumulation. One important family of transcription factors are the uh, basic helix loop helix transcription factors. Uh, pro this protein family is uh, characterized by its structural motif. It has two distinct regions. Uh, the first region being the basic region, which is involved in DNA binding. So as you can see here by the diagram, uh, the basic domain is able to bind to the uh, DNA sequence of, of its target gene via a consensus sequence called an E-box or an enhancer box. 
One example of an enhancer box is the G box. The G box are commonly present in promoters of MIA biosynthesis regulators, which is important for the, uh, the audience to know as we go into this presentation. Second is the two distinct region, the second, uh, the second distinct region, which is the helix loop helix region, which allows for uh, functional dimerization, uh, allows to form heterodimers, which uh, allows for the uh, ability uh, or allows the formation of a large number of potential DNA binding complexes with different biochemical properties, including DNA binding, activation, or repression potentials. This thereby creates a multitude of opportunities for BHLH transcription factors to regulate different genes and sets of genes. Our lab is, uh, has invested a lot of time and effort looking into basic helix loop helix transcription factors in Catharanthus roseus in the MIA biosynthesis pathway. One well acknowledged uh, master regulator, MIC2, has led to the uh, identification of the repressor MIC2 target 1 BHLH transcription factor. An important bit of information is that these GE boxes are present in uh, all the MIA uh, gene promoters, or a lot of the uh, uh, MIA gene promoters, suggesting that there are additional BHLH factors involved, as can be seen here. Our MIC2 master regulator might be activating gene expression, while repressor of MIC2 targets represses said target genes. So you can start to see the formation of a, the beginnings of like a regulatory feedback loop there, which leads us to the uh, identification of another potential regulator, CRBHLH92, which is tightly co-expressed, as can be seen here from the co-expression analysis done in our 2018 paper, um, that this could be uh, an interesting uh, target for regulation. BHLH92 is in subgroup two, and it's homologous to the Arabidopsis BHLH91. Uh, we ran a co-expression analysis to see if uh, BHLH92 was co-expressed with MIA pathway genes and regulatory genes of the MIA biosynthesis pathway. And as you can see here by the red, uh, that is true. There is a uh, significant density of that amount of co-expression going on between BHLH92 and uh, MIA biosynthetic genes. Therefore, we hypothesize that the transcription factor BHLH92 is a transcription regulator of MIA biosynthesis. Therefore, we seek to elucidate the role of BHLH92 and its possible combinatorial regulation of MIA biosynthesis. For our experimental plan, we did the co-expression analysis to identify target candidate genes. Next, we'll focus on BHLH92 by functionally characterizing BHLH92 using floral infiltration for overexpression, hairy root transformation, and virus-induced gene silencing. From there, once we functionally characterize our BHLH92, we will then look into how the properties of the promoter binding transactivation of BHLH92 using a protoplast transactivation assay. From there, we will then investigate possible combinatorial um, regulatory genes using a toolbox of uh, different methods and protocols as can be seen in the red to answer said question. For our floral infiltration uh, experiment for BHLH92, we generated four overexpression lines. Of these four overexpression lines, we selected overexpression line two and four as they were kind of a standardized median or uh, middle, middle uh, example to compare against our EB control. For the expression of AP2 ERF transcription factors, ORCAs two, three, five, and six, we saw an increase in expression levels. For the genes in the uh, indole pathway, as well as the master regulator MIC2, we saw an increase in TEC expression. And for the iridoid, iridoid pathway, we saw an uh, expression increase for six different iridoid pathway genes, which led to the uh, proposed model, as you can see here on the right side of this uh, PowerPoint, that BHLH92, after JA, a burst of JA uh, occurs, um, the expression of BHLH92 leads to an increase or leads to the regula regulation of the transcription of downstream transcription factors, in this case, ORCAs, which then uh, down, uh, regulate downstream expression of target uh, genes within the MIA uh, biosynthetic pathway. For our virus-induced gene silencing, we generated knockdown lines for gene of interest using uh, VIGS, which is a reverse genetics approach. We used the PDS and CHLH gene for uh, visual markers to identify where uh, 
the virus kind of infiltrates to where we should harvest from. So uh, where would our transformation, where would our uh, virus induced gene sensing have occurred? And we use PDS and CHLH to uh, be its photo bleaching phenotype to identify where we need to extract from. We are currently in the process of measuring the alkaloid content from these transformants. For the hairy root transformation, the reason we use the hairy root transformation uh, is because there are no standard protocols for generating stable transgenic lines of catharanthus currently available. Thus, we have to use the uh, hairy root transformation uh, method. Currently, I'm in the process of generating hairy root transformants of overexpression lines, which have a, a substantial increase in expression levels of BHLH. You're at 10 minutes as well as uh, using uh, generating RNA interference lines, which knock down the expression uh, levels of our BHLH gene two. Once we've generated transformants, we will then uh, excise the portion of the root that's vis visibly, the visible hairy root that's visually distinguishable from the rest of the plant. We'll excise that and place it on a selection media as can be seen here. Um, the selection media will have a specific uh, selection antibiotic. If it's able to grow and proliferate, then we will then put it onto its own plate. From there, I will excise a small portion of the top to actually verify on top of the uh, selection media. So the selection media is one degree of verification. And then the second degree of ver verification would be using the gustating to verify our transformant has the proper insert. If it does, it, and when exposed to XGLUC, it will have the blue phenotype as you can see here. From there, after we verified, we will then use an RNA expression analysis to, to see the fluctuations and expression levels in our uh, hairy root transformants. And on top of that, I will continually uh, propagate roots for uh, future experiments analysis. For my protoplast transactivation assay, we first fuse the GAL4 binding domain to the BHLH92 to see what, what, what regulatory function does BHLH92. When, when these are fused, uh, GAL4 binding domain will attach itself to its respective response element here above the uh, cauliflower mosaic virus 35S minimal promoter, which is just like a Tata box. The GAL4 binding domain fused with the BHLH92, the GAL4 binding domain will bind to the response element and the BHLH92 will either activate or repress the uh, activity of the luciferase downstream luciferase overreading frame gene. From the results, we show that BHLH92 is an activator. Then we did uh, a second protoplast transactivation assay to see if uh, BHLH92 actually directly transactivates TDC or IS, which are the genes that we saw earlier in the floral infiltration that were like increased when uh, BHLH92 was overexpressed, they increased in expression levels. So we know that they interact, there's something there. And so we wanted to see if BHLH92 directly, directly binds to TDC and IS promoter which is fused to a luciferase uh, open reading frame. If it's able to bind, then it will transactivate and uh, increase in uh, the luciferase activity as seen in the first one, but that was not the case. It was unable to transactivate in tobacco protoplast. We believe that it's, it's an interesting question because why was BHLH92 able to transactivate or was able to uh, increase the RNA expression of target genes in the flow infiltration overexpression lines, but was unable to transactivate the TDC IS promoters in our uh, protoplast transactivation assay. And that asks, that leads us to the, the speculation that maybe there's a co-activator involved. Maybe a partner is needed from co, co, uh, catharanthus for this, uh, this activation to occur. Therefore, we looked to the literature to find an answer for that. And we found that in QE 2016, that they reported in plant interactions of the Arabidopsis subgroup three, BHLH transcription factor or co-activator dysfunctional tapetum one, that it interacted with the member subgroup two, BHLH 91 in Arabidopsis. BHLH 91 is an activator and does not bind to the promoter, but rather interacts with group three to, to actually activate the, its target genes. BHLH91 plays a role in nuclear localization of DYT1. The closest homolog of uh, BHLH92 in Arabidopsis is the subgroup uh, to BHLH91. Currently, there are no known uh, subgroup to BHLH transcription vectors known to regulate specialized metabolism in any plant currently. Therefore, with the DYT in mind, we uh, identified a, a BHLH of subgroup three homologous to DYT1. You've got about a minute left. With my with uh, with the uh, focus 
with my time, I will focus on its function to identify its function and then uh, to see what, how it co-regulates with BHLH92. As you can see here from the Chrome Expression Analysis data that um, it does interact with a ton of the uh, MIA regulatory uh, genes throughout the MIA biosynthesis bio pathway. Thus, I made a new updated version of the proposed model with DYT1 uh, needed for the co-activation of downstream target genes. In summary, uh, Catharanthus is a valuable medicinal plant. Uh, MI transcriptional regulation network not fully elucidated. We hypothesize that there's additional BHLH transcription factors that activate the uh, activators present in our regulation network. We've identified subgroup 2 BHLH92 and speculate subgroup 2 BHLH92 interacts with a subgroup 3 BHLH DYT1. The significance of this paper is that somehow Gantherethens has somehow uh, possibly evolved a co-regulatory mechanism of subgroup 2 and 3 BHLH BHLH transcription factors for specialized metabolite biosynthesis. That is the end of my presentation. Thank you for your time. Are there any questions? We actually don't have time for any questions, so we'll just move right on to the next presentation. All right. But thank you. So our last presenter of the day then is Tajbir Raihan, and his advisor is Dr. Rodriguez Lopez. Uh, hi, Josh. Uh, can you like? Stop sharing so that I can share my screen. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, thanks, Amber, for the really, really nice introduction. And I'd like to thank you all. I'm the last presenter. You still so many people are here. Uh, it's amazing. So today I'm going to talk about a soybean population, which we uh, treat it chemically and causes, it causes the DNA demethylation all over the genome and causes the phenotypic variation, not only in first generation and also in the second generation too. So before going into too deep, uh, let's talk about what is actually epigenetics. So epigenetics is a study of heritable phenotypic changes without any kind of alteration in the DNA sequence. So there are like lots of mechanism, how organism can do that but uh, one of them is DNA methylation. So this, uh, like cells use this DNA methylation all the time to turn on or turn off the function of the gene. And you know, plants naturally exhibit variation in gene methylation, which also ex exhibit, affect their expression level. Okay, so the naturally, natural variability, uh, it can be enhanced in an analogous form of genetic mutation breeding uh, by, by, creating a chemically in, by creating chemically induced global hypomethylation. And uh, how we can do that? We can actually do the global hypomethylation by uh, some sort of chemical treatment. And uh, one of such chemical is 5 cytidine. This 5 cytidine is... Uh, uh, one of the chemical analog of nucleoside cytidine and how it actually functions, you know, the DNA methyl transference enzyme, it actually responsible for transferring the methyl group to the DNA. And uh, when yeah, actually fibers of cytidine works, it actually blocks the action of DNA methyl transference. And as a result, so there, there is like a global T methylation happens. And we can use this technique to identify the genes controlling the traits of interest. So let's get into our research. Uh, in case of first generation, what we did, we uh, take soybean cultivar 80, Williams 82, and we treat them with various concentration of uh, uh, fibers, fibers of cytidine, and also there was water control too. And um, this, uh, th this concentration is like starting from 0.01 mm up to 1.5 mm of fibers of cytidine. And after treating them, what we did, we did uh, the germination of the seeds in the petri dishes. So after uh, the germination of the seeds, we transferred the seeds uh, into the pores in the greenhouse. And then after that, we randomly allocate those pores into five block experimental design. And here at the right side, you can see the five block here and different color here represents a uh, different treatment group, like red actually representing the control. And there are like total 300 plants and uh, six treatment groups, including the water control. So 50 plants each. 
and after that we actually uh, see uh, like examine the population for various phenotypes so uh, when actually plants uh, gave us the first true leaf, we collected the leaf and we extracted the DNA from there. And after we extracted the DNA, we used that DNA to uh, do the ELISA test. So what this ELISA test does, it actually accurately quantify the global level of DNA methylation. And for this purpose, the kit we use, it, the kit was from Chimo Research. So. After the ELISA test, we use the uh, we actually take the ELISA plate and put them uh, put it in the ELISA plate reader, and then we actually test the absorbance in 450 nm. So here the higher absorbance means that higher level of DNA methylation, and the lower absorbance means lower level of DNA methylation. And here you can see the control group; it has higher level of DNA methylation, and with the increasing concentration it gradually decreases up to 0.5. And after that, it start to increase. It seems a little bit conflicting, I know, but actually there is a perfect, good, perfectly good explanation for that. Because when we treat the soybean seeds with fibers of cytidine, so excessive concentration of fibers of cytidine, it actually kills a lot of the seeds, uh, like 50% to 60%. And when it actually kills a lot of the seeds, only the surviving seeds, it actually, uh, gives this kind of uh, reading. So the surviving seeds, we are actually hypothesizing that they are actually uh, didn't soak up enough fibers of cytidine to kill themselves. So that's why these conflicting results happen. So let's talk about how fibers of cytidine actually affect the germination and also the emergence. So here in the picture, you can see the germination at the day two. Uh, you can see that a control group, it has like higher germination rate rather than all the treatment groups and it gradually decreases with the increasing of the concentration. Uh, but at germination day three, they kind of cope up with each other. So which actually indicates that, um, that this fibers of cytidine, it actually doesn't block the germination, but what it does, it actually delays the germination. The similar thing we also observe in case of emergence, here you can see in the picture, which is really, really clear that the control group has like higher emergence rate um, comparing the treatment group, like here white and yellow is the higher concentration, one and 1.5, you can see they're very much delayed in uh, emergence comparing the control group. So uh, let's talk about how fibers of cytidine affect the plant height and plant canopy area. So if you carefully look at this picture, you can see it's almost follow the same pattern of the ELISA test. With increasing concentration, it gradually decreases size up to 0.5 mm and then it again increase. So the same thing that actually the surviving plants, they didn't soak up enough fibers of cytidine to give them like this phenotypic like like big phenotypic changes. So that's why it happens for 1.5 and one. But here it's clear that fibers of cytidine, it actually causing the dwarfism and reduced canopy size. Let's uh, talk about the average seed weight in various treatment groups. Here you can see there is significant difference between control group and uh, some of the treatment group like 0.81 mm concentration, which is really, really significant. And uh, seed weight actually decreased in case of treatment group. Now on my favorite work, <laughs> it is the near infrared analysis. We actually checked 45 seed composition pairs using this near infrared analysis, but for the time and uh, for having not enough time and uh, not enough space, I'm not showing all of them. So here I'm showing nine of the uh, nine of the uh, uh, nutrient composition. So here I'm not showing them the real nutrient composition. Here I'm showing the differences between standard deviation between control group and treatment group. And why I'm showing it? Because like uh, when fibrous cytidine works, fibrous cytidine works by actually causing the DNA methylation randomly all over the genome. And when it actually causes this demethylation all over the genome, it causes the random phenotypic differences. So that's why we, we expect that the treatment group supposed to have uh, more standard deviation, more variability uh, comparing the control group. But here in this picture, you can see all the treatment groups together, they have higher variability 
comparing the control group. So, and when we use the two tailed pair t test to evaluate the differences in standard deviation, and we find out the p value is less than 0 0.001. So, that means that phenotypic variation is higher in epimutant po population than the wild type. Now let's talk about the second generation. So uh, in the second generation, we also have 300 plants. Uh, what we did, uh, we, we had 300 plants, but uh, we didn't take the six treatment groups like before. This time we exclude two right, groups, 10 minutes. Uh, so which is 0 0.1 mm and 1.5 mm. And why we did that? Because like these are like too extreme that 0 0.1 mm is like too less uh, almost like neg negligible and 1.5 mm is very high concentration. So that's why you exclude these. And there are like 300 plants like before, 15 control plants and 95 plants per treatment group. And we actually distributed them in five block experimental design like before. So we again did the uh, five as uh, like the five in CTNA ELISA test. And we find out to the wild type again, it shows higher methylation than the epimutant population, and it is significant. We checked 15 different phenotypic traits and 45 seed composition traits, and uh, due to lack of time, I'm showing a representative of one of the traits, like average seed weight. Here you can see the mutant group, the, which is all the treatment group together, showing higher variability than the control group. So now we did the same uh, near infrared analysis for 45 seed composition traits. And here also in the second generation, we find out that the all treatment groups together, they showed higher variability than the control group. And when we do the uh, two-tailed pair t-test, uh, the standard deviation difference uh, is like, uh, when we did the two-tailed pair t-test, we find out the p-value is less than 0.005. So in conclusion, what we can say that a five as a cytidine, it causes stochastic demethylation or random demethylation throughout the soybean genome. And this comparatively higher standard deviation of treatment groups over the control groups, uh, it also causes the random phenotypic diversity. Uh, and also this de-random DNA demethylation and random phenotypic diversity in also can be seen in the second generation too. So this is stochastically hypomethylated population. It can be a very uh, powerful tool to identify the loci controlling the traits of interest. So currently the work in progress is like we are doing the epigenotyping, uh, epigenoty epigenotyping of second generation using the next generation sequencing. And also we are planning to do like AP genome wide association study to find out some epilocy controlling specific traits of interest. Like we are mostly uh, interested about the seed composition. So I'd like to thank uh, my advisor, Dr. Carlos Lopez for being an amazing advisor he is. And also Dr. Corbin, Dr. Uh, McKenzie, Kiflu, and uh, Dr. Salmeron for helping me throughout the project with advice and uh, so many other things. And I'd like to uh, thank all the EGG lab members for being the amazing lab members they are. So uh, thank you. And if anybody of you have any question, I'd be really happy to answer. Okay, so we have a question. We have two questions in the chat. So the first one is, please, ex please explain again why plant size decreased at first with increasing concentrations of five as a citrodyne, but then it increased again with the highest concentration concentrations. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, can, you, can you please repeat the question? I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, you're good. Please explain why the pl plant size decreased at first with increasing concentrations of 5 as a citrodyne, but then increased again with the highest concentrations. I got it. Thank you. It's, it's a really nice question. Um, actually, uh, the, what actually happened over there is like, when we actually soak the soybean seeds with a uh, various concentration of five as a cytidine, the concentration one and 1.5 mm was very much higher and it actually killed a lot of soybean seeds. They didn't germinate. So as a result, what actually happened, the uh, seeds which actually survived, uh, we hypothesized that they actually didn't soak enough five as a cytidine to actually kill themselves. So that's why they actually shows this conflicting result because they didn't actually soak enough fibers as a cited in. So there's a thing actually. 
Okay. And then you have one more question. I mean, that might be all we have time for. Did you confirm by any experiment that more than 0 0.5 mm condition seeds could not absorb the chemical? Question. Uh, let me check. Did you confirm by any experiment that more than 0.5 mm conditions is good enough? Uh, uh, actually, seed, seed absorb uh, after 0.5 mm. Because that's why they actually died, you know, like some of the seeds, they actually died because they absorb too many of the chemicals. So actually, yeah, seed actually absorb more than like uh, when the concentration is more than 5 mm, they actually absorbed, yeah. Uh, but um, uh, you, we, we actually didn't do any kind of experiment to evaluate the absorbance, but actually it absorbed 0.5 mm, up to 0.5 mm over. That's all the questions we have time for. Thank you for all the presentations in this last session. And then I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Jason Unrein for any closing remarks. All right, well, thank you everyone. I think this went extremely well. Um, I was very impressed with the presentations. You know, despite our challenges, I think the quality of the presentations was as good or better than it's ever been. Um, and again, I'd like to thank um, our organizing committee, the moderators, all the faculty judges, um, and especially uh, Abby and Audrey for keeping everything running and setting up the website. Um, so I think what we're gonna do now is we're gonna tabulate the scores offline. Um, and we'll be announcing the winners of the, the poster and uh, oral presentation awards. So we have first, second, and third place awards. Um, we'll be announcing those by email once we get all the scores tabulated. Um, and so if any of the judges, if you haven't turned in your scores yet, if you could please let Abby know by email when you're finished uh, completing your, your judging forms. Um, so with that, just like to give all of our presenters and moderators a round of applause. Thank you very much and have a wonderful weekend. Bye everybody. <laughs>